Hello, I'm Kirby Kruckmeyer, a radiation engineer at Texas Instruments. Today I'll be talking about cosmic irradiation effects on electronics and how to pick the right part for your space application. Today's talk will be taken from TI's Radiation Handbook for Electronics, which can be downloaded at ti.com slash radbook. This talk will focus mainly on space radiation effects with only a few comments about terrestrial radiation. We will be covering destructive radiation effects, non-destructive radiation effects, the risk of using commercial off-the-shelf products for space applications, and some very common radiation misconceptions and myths. First, let me introduce myself. I'm an application and radiation effects engineer in Texas Instruments High Reliability Group, where we develop products for the space and military markets. I have experience in all aspects of developing and qualifying products for the space and military markets. Previously, I developed and qualified parts for the automotive market. There are two main sources of radiation in space. There's natural and man-made. The natural sources are cosmic radiation from outside our solar system, solar radiation, and particles trapped in the radiation belts. The particles in the natural environment are electrons, protons, and heavy ions. The amount of exposure a satellite will see over a given period of time will be dependent on orbit and solar activity. Man-made source is nuclear detonation and the particles of interest are neutrons and photons. This table summarizes the four main radiation effects seen in space. I'll discuss each one of these effects in more detail later on in the talk. The four main major radiation effects are TID or total ionizing dose, SEE or single event effects, DDD or displacement damage, and prompt dose. In space, the major source of TID is electrons and protons. On Earth, it's mostly X-rays and gamma rays. TID is the accumulated ionizing dose over a period of time. The ionizing radiation causes charging of dielectrics in an integrated circuit, which can eventually lead to failure of the circuit. Typically, testing is done using gamma rays. Mitigation for TID, other than using a rad hard IC that can withstand the dose of the mission, is to use shielding, but this adds cost and weight to the system. Single event effects are caused by high energy protons or heavy ions in space. On Earth, the concern is with neutrons. As the name suggests, the single event effect is a one time event caused by a high energy particle striking a circuit resulting in an event such as a transient, an upset, a latch up, or damage or other effects. Testing is done with an accelerator. High energy heavy ions and protons typically cannot be shielded in space. So the, any mitigation involves adding extra circuitry to the systems such as redundancy or a detection and reset circuit. This adds complexity, cost, and downtime to the systems. Displacement damage is caused by protons crashing into an integrated circuit and damaging the silicon lattice. On Earth, we test this with neutrons. Prompt dose is caused by a flash of photons from a nuclear explosion. This results in large photocurrents developing inside the die. Prompt dose is sometimes known as dose rate upset or dose rate latch up. Testing is done with a flash x-ray. Ionizing radiation can charge dielectrics such as oxide and nitride and result in traps in the dielectric. Ionizing radiation can also cause surface states at the oxide silicon interface. This leads to increased leakages and soft breakdowns. This can cause a rise in supply current and bias currents and also degrade many parameters such as offset voltage, response time. It can also result in a shift in an output voltage of a regulator and ultimately to non-functionality of the part. 
In this plot, I'm showing the input bias current of a op amp versus radiation dosage. As the dose increases, the input leakage increases. TID can be shielded to some extent, but this adds weight and cost to the mission. And it's not always 100% mitigation. Kilorads is the most common unit used for expressing radiation damage in electronics. RAD stands for radiation absorbed dose and is in the centimeter gram seconds units. A RAD is the amount of dose causing 100 ergs of energy to absorb in one gram of matter. One kilorad is equal to a thousand rad. The medical community tends to use gray as the radiation units which are in international standard units. One gray equals a hundred rad. Although the main source of TID in space is protons and electrons, the standard for doing TID testing is with gamma rays from a cobalt-60 source. To do the testing, the device under test, or DUT, is electrically tested per the data sheet. It is powered up and then irradiated. After irradiation, the DUT is retested to see if it's still functional or if any critical parameters have shifted. RLAT stands for Radiation Lot Acceptance Testing, and it can be done either on a wafer or a wafer lot. The picture on the right is of Texas Instruments TID test system. ELDER stands for Enhanced Low Dose Rate Sensitivity. The standard radiation test is an accelerated test done at a high dose rate. At 300 rads per second, it takes less than 6 minutes to reach 100 k rads. But in space, a system can take up to 10 years to reach 100 k rad. It was discovered that some linear bipolar products degrade more at low dose rate than they do at high dose rate. And sometimes the worst case is with the unbiased instead of being biased. So the old way of doing testing at high dose rate with the units biased is not valid for some space programs. In the plot on the right, I am showing the drift of a reference versus radiation. The blue lines are when the parts are radiated at high dose rate, and the red lines are when the parts are radiated at low dose rate. And it can be seen that for this product, it's worse at low dose rate than the part has elders. Bipolar linear parts should be characterized for elders. To do the characterization, some units are radiated at high dose rate and other units are radiated at low dose rate, and the results are compared. If the drift at low dose rate is more than at high dose rate, then part is said to have elders, and our lap must be done at low dose rate. If the product does not show significantly more drift at low dose rate, the part is considered to be elders free, and RLAT can be either done at high dose rate or low dose rate. Testing to 100 KRADs at low dose rate can take almost six months. TI still tests some of the classic bipolar parts like the LM124 and 139 at low dose rate, even though the products have been shown to be elders free. A single event effect occurs when a single heavy ion or high energy proton impacts a device. This ion will create a trail of hole and electron pairs which can be swept up into the electric field of the device. A heavy ion strike can cause many different kinds of effects. There are non-destructive effects and destructive effects. Typically, the heavy ions and protons cannot be shielded. Here is an extreme example of the repercussions of a single event effect. The flight control computer of a jet had a single event upset which caused the plane to go into a steep dive. This caused damage to the plane and sent 18 people to the hospital. Here are two examples of single events in space. The photo on the left is a thermal image of the Earth. Inside the red circle is a green dot that was caused by a single event upset. On the right is the log of the major events on the image satellite. 
Here we can see that the computer had to be reset due to a single event upset. And eventually, the satellite lost communication due to a single event upset. Perhaps the radiation effect of most concern is a single event latch up. Most CMOS products are at risk and it can be destructive. Most CMOS products have parasitic PNPN structures in the middle of the circuit that can act like a silicon controlled rectifier or SCR. An ion can strike the middle of the part and turn on this SCR, which won't turn off until the whole part is powered down. This SCR like structure can draw more current than the circuit was designed to carry. This can cause the product to malfunction, it will impact the life of the part, and it will eventually destroy the device. In some cases, this can be less than one second. Some CMOS products are inherently immune because they don't have the PNP and structures that could form an SCR. It's greatly dependent on the design and or the technology node. It is hard to determine which products would be immune unless you have an intimate knowledge of the design and the process. And even with an intimate design of the design and process, it's, a product still might have to be tested to verify whether it's going to have SCL or not. SCL is unlikely in standard bipolar products that are junction isolated. But TI tests new products and new technologies anyway to verify that SCL does not exist. For a product that has SCL, mitigation is either redundancy or designing a circuit that will detect the SEL and then resetting the circuit once the SEL is detected. And this can add complexity, weight, and system downtime. A single event functional interrupt, or a CEPHI, is when a product goes into a different state due to an ion strike. It was first identified when a memory chip went into a test mode from an ion strike. For parts that are programmed, an ion strike can cause a bit to flip, causing the part to go into a different configuration, and it may be necessary to reprogram the part. For a product with a reset circuit, an ion strike might cause the product to go into reset. Some products recover on their own, some may need to be reconfigured after the reset. For a product with an off pin, an ion strike could cause the part to go into an off state. For parts with Cephes, mitigation is doing a periodic register scrub. This requires additional resources and system downtime. At one time, nearly every non-destructive single event effect was called an SCU. But now the definition has been narrowed to a digital bit flipping from either a 1 to a 0 or a 0 to a 1. Almost all products will exhibit SCUs when tested with heavy ions. What is important is the energy or probability of the SCU occurring. If the probability is low enough or energy needs to be high enough, an SCU might not occur in certain orbits. A single event transient or SET is a transient on an analog output caused by an ion strike. In the plot on the right, I'm showing the output of a voltage reference. It should be at 2.5 volts. At time zero is when the ion strike happens, causing the output to drop. It takes time for the output to recover, and it overshoots its voltage, and finally recovers to the specified voltage in about seven microseconds. In older papers, and even in some newer papers, SETs are still called SCUs. Almost all analog products will have SETs under the wrong operating conditions. SETs are highly dependent on the operating conditions of the part, especially for a product that has a wide operating range. For a regulator, things that can impact the transient time and amplitude include input voltage, output voltage, current, and capacitance. SETs can be mitigated by the proper operating and application conditions. In the table on the right, we show that for the 4050-2.5 voltage reference, SETs can be totally mitigated by adding a 60 microfarad capacitor to the output. The destructive single event effects are single event burnout, single event 
gate rupture and single event dialectic rupture. Single event burnout and single event gate rupture are effects on power MOSFETs. SEB and SEGR are two different mechanisms but sometimes they can be hard to distinguish from another, one another. What ends up happening is the gate oxide gets destroyed from one or more than one ion strike. The susceptibility to SEB and SEGR are voltage and current dependent. For commercial products that exhibit SEB and SEGR, it can become necessary to derate these products for space missions. For instance, a 100 volt MOSFET may have to be derated down to 40 volts due to these effects. TI's products are already characterized and derating is not needed. On the graph on the right, we show the safe operating range for the TPS 50601-SP space grade point of load regulator. The y-axis is the safe input voltage and the x-axis is the maximum load. And the green area is the safe operating range for the part. Single event dielectric rupture is very similar to single event gate rupture but it concerns non-transistor devices such as capacitor oxides. Heavy ion testing is done at a cyclotron. There are only a few facilities in the US or in Europe and beam time can sometimes be hard to get. The cost is a thousand to four thousand dollars per hour for beam time alone. Testing a product can take four to twenty four hours and in some cases even more beam time. In addition to the beam time cost there's the cost of doing the test setup and analyzing the data. Many times analyzing the data is not a trivial matter. Proton testing is done at similar facilities, but other types of accelerators may be used. At most heavy ion facilities, the beam cannot penetrate packaging and the DUT must be delitted to expose the dye to the beam. This can be a challenge for certain new packages like flip chips. During the testing, the DUT is powered up and operating during the testing. While the part is bombarded with heavy ions during a beam run, many different parameters can be monitored. For SEL, we'll want to monitor supply current. For SEU and SET, we'll monitor the outputs. And for Cephe, we'll see if the part is, remains functional. On the right is a picture of TI's PIX board that's specifically designed for radiation testing. This board is uh, shown at the beam at Texas A&M University's cyclotron. Here are some important parameters for SCE testing. LET or linear energy transfer is the amount of energy deposited in silicon by the ion. It'll be different for different ions. The units for LET are MeV times centimeters squared divided by milligrams or energy divided by density. Because MeV times centimeters squared divided by milligrams is a mouthful, engineers uh, typically shorten the units to just simply MeV, although that's not technically correct. During a ion run, we will record the fluence, which is the number of ions shot at the dut during the beam run. The units for this is ions per square centimeter. The number of errors recorded during the beam run is also noted. With this information, the cross section is calculated. The cross section is the number of errors divided by the fluence and the unit is centimeter squared. The cross section gives a prediction of probability of a single event occurring. And then we plot the cross section versus the LET. As you can see in this plot on the right, we have the cross section on the y axis and LET on the x axis. 
If single events are seen for LETs below 14 MeV, it might indicate that the part is also sensitive to protons and proton testing will be done. Once the cross section is plotted against the LET, the data can be fitted with a Weibull curve. This is the equation for a Weibull curve. On the plot here, the diamonds are the data and the orange line is the Weibull curve that was fitted to the data. The Weibull fit parameters can be used with certain programs to determine the probability of a single event occurring in a certain orbit. A popular program is CREAM 96 and here we have used CREAM 96 to predict the upset rates in a low earth orbit and a geosynchronous orbit. The mean time between events for this particular part in a LEO orbit is one event every 70,000 years and in a geo orbit one event in every 21,000 years. Protons in space can cause displacement damage by a proton striking a silicon atom and knocking it out of place. This causes traps in the silicon which can tie up carriers to the holes in the electrons. It can also cause leakages in the part. A device susceptibility to displacement damage is dependent on the device's feature size, active junction depth, and technology. Some bipolar parts are very sensitive to displacement damage and can fail when they see proton strikes of 10 to the 12th protons per square centimeter or less. CMOS parts tend to survive much greater fluences of protons and sometimes can survive 10 to the 13th protons per centimeter squared or more. Many programs with displacement dose requirements do not bother to test CMOS products. The test method for displacement damage is parts are stuck in a bag in a nuclear reactor and they're not powered up. They're irradiated and sometimes they become radioactive and it's necessary to wait for them to cool down. After irradiation and cool down, the parts are electrically tested. Neutrons are used instead of protons in doing displacement damage testing because protons also have total ionizing dose effects. The neutrons are used so that the displacement damage can be separated out from the effects of TID. In some testing, a product will go through displacement damage and then will be followed with total ionizing dose testing to see the cumulative effect of displacement damage and TID. A nuclear detonation can cause a flash of high energy photons. The dose rate here is many orders of magnitude higher than that is used for TID testing. This flash can cause photocurrents to occur within the device. The photocurrents can cause effects that are very similar to single event effects, but multiple effects can occur at once. Prompt dose testing is also known as dose rate testing, but this is not to be confused with low dose rate testing or high dose rate total ionizing dose testing. To do the testing is very similar to single event testing or heavy ion testing. The dud is powered up and operating and monitored. The dud is then exposed to a flash x-ray. The results of prompt dose testing or flash x-ray testing are highly dependent upon the operating conditions at the time of the flash and the dose rate of the flash. Suppliers do not typically do prompt dose or flash x-ray testing because the dose rate and the operating conditions are usually classified. RHA products or radiation hardness assurance products are products that are tested and qualified to a specific TID level. Each lot goes through TID radiation lot acceptance testing or RLAT. RLAT can be done on a wafer level or on a single wafer. RLAT is done either at low dose rate or high dose rate depending upon the technology.
and a TID report is available for each lot. By definition in the military standards, TID is the only radiation effect that is required for a part to be considered RHA. However, TI goes well beyond that definition and tests for other radiation effects. The TID level is shown in the SMD number or 5962 number. On the right, we show a snippet from the LM98640 QML-SP datasheet. It is an RHA part, but you can also see that it also has specifications for single event latch up and single event functional interrupt. MILPERF 38535 is a military standard on how to manufacture, qualify, and test military and space grade products. It replaced MIL standard 38510 a couple decades ago. MIL standard 883 is the test methods for meeting MIL perf 38535. Test method 1019 is the test method for doing total ionizing dose testing. The SMD is a standard microcircuit drawing. It is the Department of Defense's data sheet for our space grade QMLV qualified products. It contains the electrical specifications and test specifications for manufacturing the part, but does not contain any application information and it's still necessary to visit TI.com and the TI data sheets to get application information. The SMD will list its own unique part numbers for TI products. In this table here, we show the SMD number and the corresponding TI part number for the LM124 space grade products. The DLA is the Defense Logistics Agency Land and Maritime, and they are the owner of the SMDs and the MIL standards. They were formerly known as DESI, spelled a number of different ways. The SMD number, or 5962 number, contains a lot of information about the product. I have it color coded here. The R in purple indicates the radiation rating. R is for 100 K rads. If there's a dash, there's no radiation guarantee. The red 99 is the year the SMD was started. 99 is for 1999. In green is the device number. In this case, it's device 02. The device number is to distinguish this particular part from other variants that are still uh, that are in the same SMD. In this SMD, the O2 indicates that this device is elders free. The old one devices in this SMD are not elders free. The purple V stands for space grade. Q is for mill, and Y is for space grade parts in non-hermetic ceramic packages. In the previous 38510 system, space was indicated by an S and mill was indicated by a B. The second to last character is the package. In this case, C equals C dip. A D is typically ceramic flat pack, and a 9 is die. But the lettering is not universal for all uh, products, so a Z might be something different in another SMD. But it explained in the SMD what the letters do mean. The final character is the lead finish. A is for tin lead solder, and a C is for gold lead finish. Texas Instruments space grade product family can be identified by the dash sp suffix at the end of the generic part names of the products. These products are tested, manufactured, and qualified per the QMLV flow of MILPERF 38535. This includes tri-temp testing and 100% burn-on in all products. They're in hermetic packaging and there's no matte tin lead finish. The temp range is the military temp range of minus 55 to plus 25 degrees C. Most of the space grade products are RHA or radiation hardened. RHA and RLAT products are specified to the TID level shown in the SMD and data sheet. They've been elders characterized. They are SEL immune to, a spec uh, to the specified level, at least 60 MeV. 
Other single events have been characterized and reports are available. And TI has begun doing displacement damage testing on all new products. There are some older TI space releases that might not be RHA. This table shows the range of TI's product offerings, starting with commercial grade parts. Next are Q1 or automotive grade parts. EP products are products for military applications that do not require ceramic packaging or full military qualification. QML Q parts are fully qualified military products and ceramic packages. SEP products are geared towards space applications that do not have the stringent radiation requirements or long-term reliability requirements that QMLV RHA products deliver. There are many risks to using commercial off-the-shelf parts or Q100 automotive grade parts in a radiation environment. Most CMOS products are at risk for SEL. Power products can have single event gate rupture or single event burnout and may need derating. TID levels are, are unknown for most products and most technologies unless testing is done. Bipolar products can have elders. Radiation sensitivity can be highly dependent upon design. Two products using the same process can have very different rad responses. Semiconductor suppliers cannot share the intimate details about process and design that would help to determine if a part is going to be radiation tolerant or not. This is proprietary information that gives the supplier a competitive advantage. Lot-to-lot -lot variations can impact radiation response. Radiation testing is very costly and time-consuming. And there are many myths out there about radiation. EPI or SOI does not mean SEL immunity, and date code really does not provide useful lot information. One method to making a product immune to SEL involves using an EPI substrate. This is a highly engineered process, and EPI is just one small part of it. Most commercial CMOS processes use EPI but still have SEL. In this diagram on the right, I'm showing a cross-section of a CMOS device. EPI is the thin layer on top of the substrate. The substrate can either be P- or P+. In most CMOS processes, the substrate is P-. In order to do radiation hardening and with a EPI substrate, this substrate must be P+, and not P-. But going to a P plus substrate can sometimes cause problems with the device that might require redesign. Once the P plus substrate is used, the epi thickness has to be thin enough to prevent the SCR from forming so that the part can be SCL immune. A typical CMOS process, the epi thickness is not thin enough to prevent SCL. So it is necessary to experiment with thinning the epi. Thinning the epi can also cause performance problems such as lowering the well breakdown. A lot of engineering work goes into developing the rad hard process. In this plot on the right, we show the probability of SEL for different epi thicknesses. This line is for a 12 micron thick epi layer, and it has a, a lot higher probability of SEL happening and it requires a lot lower energy than the product with the 8 micron epi layer. SOI stands for silicon on insulator. The active area of the device sits on a buried oxide layer or called box as shown in the diagram on the left. If the process uses a deep trench isolation that reaches all the way down through the active area down to the box, the P well and N well are separated and an SCR cannot form and the product will be SCL immune. However, if you have a shallow trans isolation or STI that does not reach down all the way through to the box, you still have the PNPN structures that are at risk for SCL. It is common in bi CMOS processes to use DTI in the bipolar module but still use STI in the CMOS module. 
In older CMOS products, the single event latch up was pretty obvious, where the supply current could jump several times its normal value. In newer, complex CMOS products, it might not be so obvious. Many products have micro SELs where the current just jumps a, a small amount due to a SEL. The current is limited either by the power supply to the latch circuit or the size of the SCR that latched up. If a part is under the beam for a long period of time being hit by a, a number of ions, it is common to see multiple small rises in currents as different areas of the circuit latch up. A lot of times with these micro SELs, the part remains mostly functional. And if the part just runs for several minutes without being reset, there's no apparent damage to the part. However, there is a product life risk. The area that latched up is going to be drawing more current than it was designed for. That latch circuit will eventually fail if left latched too long or after many repeated latch events. Normal process variations can have an impact on radiation performance. Wafer fabs have many controls in place to maintain consistent electrical performance and quality. But the variables that impact radiation performance are different and not as tightly controlled. Some of the variables impacting TID are the passivation stack and stoichiometry, the field oxide process, metal alignment, and surface doping levels. Variables impacting single event effects include substrate parameters, epi thickness, junction profiles, and slight variations in die layout or critical dimensions. One example is how process variation can impact SEL susceptibility. A typical epi process has a control of 20 plus or minus 20 percent for epi thickness plus or minus 20 percent for epi doping and plus or minus 33 percent for substrate doping. The epi and substrate doping can further impact the effective epi thickness. The control of these parameters are this loose because these parameters typically do not have an impact on the electrical performance of the device. However, as this table on the right shows, just a half a micron difference in epi thickness can mean the difference between SEL and no SEL. So to ensure SEL immunity on our CAN product, SV65HVD233-SP, the epi process must be controlled much tighter than a typical commercial process. Another example is the lot-to-lot -lot TID variations seen on the LM108 operational amplifier. On the table on the left, we show the radiation results of three different lots. Lot 1 was rated 100 KRAD, and Lot 3 was rated at 10 KRAD. Lot 1 and Lot 3 were processed one month apart with no changes in the process. Even within a lot, you can see wafer-to-wafer -wafer radiation performance difference. In the table on the right, we show three different wafers from the same wafer lot, and each wafer had a different radiation rating. Commercial and automotive products can be manufactured in multiple wafer fabs and be assembled in multiple assembly sites. This allows for manufacturing fl flexibility and also older wafer fabs are often closed uh, and products are transferred to newer wafer fabs. Equipment and processing are not the same in each fab. Sometimes there are radical changes during fab transfers like a die shrink or a process to topography change. These differences can impact rad performance. Different passivation tools will have different TID responses. Junction profile changes will impact the SEE response. Here are some examples of how radiation performance was impacted by process changes and wafer fab transfers. The unitrode parts were rated at 50K in their old wafer fab. When that fab closed and the parts were moved to a new wafer fab, the radiation performance dropped to 5K rad. Nitrite is an excellent moisture barrier and was introduced to greatly improve the quality of packaged plaques parts. However, the nitride layer caused the radiation performance of certain products to drop from 100 KRAD to 10 KRAD and caused elders in bipolar products. The LM139 quad comparator went through a fab transfer and at the same time went through a die shrink. These changes impacted both the SEE and TID performance of the product. 
in this plot here we show the amplitude of a transient on the output. It became much worse on the new die with the, in the new wafer fab. And the TID performance went from 100k rad down to 10k rad on one of the channels. It, it's also interesting that the that these changes cause different radiation performance on each of the four channels. As an example of multiple process flows, the SN74HC138 can be manufactured in three different wafer fabs. The, the TI wafer fab in Sherman, Texas, or two subcons in Asia. Now these three fabs will have similar processes so that the electric performance of the product will be the same no matter which fab it's created in. However, these three fabs will have different process equipment, different recipes, and different control limits. These changes in process might not affect electrical performance, but they will affect the radiation performance of the product. The product can also be assembled in different assembly sites. Two TI sites, one in Mexico or, and Taiwan, and one at a subcon. Again, the processes are similar enough so that the package part will look the same no matter which site it comes from. However, the small differences in processes, such as um, mold compound, could have an impact on the radiation performance of the product. Date code tells you nothing about the wafer lot. The four-digit date code is the date the product was assembled. For commercial products, uh, that is the date it was encapsulated in plastic. For hermetic packages, that was the date the lid was sealed. Date code has no wafer lot information for commercial and automotive products. Wafers can be stored for years before being assembled. So a date code could come from wafer lots that are a couple years old. One date code is likely to be assembled from more than one wafer. One date code can actually be used from different wafer lots. And in some uh, extreme cases, one date code can come from units that could come from different wafer fabs. In summary, there are many radiation effects in space that can impact a product's life and performance. Predicting a product's radiation response requires intimate knowledge of the design and process, and this is usually not available to customers. Choosing and testing parts can be expensive and time-consuming. Standard commercial and automotive fab variations can impact product rad performance. The customer has no insight into lot variations. The date code does not provide meaningful lot information. There is no guarantee that the product used will have the same radiation points as those units that were tested. TI space products are tested and qualified up front. We do the testing and verification so you don't have to. More information can be found just by typing ti.com slash space into your browser. The radiation handbook for electronics can be found at ti.com slash radbook. At ti.com slash space, we have many more training videos and other information for applications and radiation support. For all of our RHA products, radiation reports can be found on the product page, the dash SP product page, on ti.com under the technical documents tab.